Hi guys, welcome to uh, the fourth pharmacology review. Uh, in this uh, uh, review, we'll be uh, starting with the topic of antiarrhythmics. Um, so I think to understand antiarrhythmics, you have to really understand the physiology of uh, the uh, action potential of the SA node and the ventricular uh, myocytes. So first, we're going to review the SA and the AV node action potential. So in uh, the nodes, there is three phases. There is phase four, phase zero, and phase three. Phase four um, is a spontaneous depolarization due to the funny current. So uh, you get some sodium that uh, slowly flows into the cell until, until it reaches a certain threshold and then the cell depolarizes and then fires an action potential. And really this is what causes the SA node to be uh, to have the characteristic of automaticity that it beats on its own and that's what causes the heart to beat on its own. Uh, the slow uh, the slow flow of, of sodium, which is the funny current. Um, there are certain things that increase or decrease the uh, the slope of phase four. So things that decrease it uh, are acetylcholine is the first thing, so the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, adenosine uh, decrease phase four. Uh, beta blockers decrease phase four. Uh, digoxin um, and ivaberidine, and all these things decrease uh, the slope of phase four, and then hence they decrease the heart rate, and we'll talk about why they decrease it. Um, on the opposite end, catecholamines increase the slope uh, of phase four, and then hence they increase the heart rate. So that's the first thing, the phase four. After you've depolarized uh, the cell, you get phase. You've get you've gotten phase zero. Uh, that's in depolarization, and uh, in phase zero, you got some opening of voltage-gated calcium channel. So you can also block this phase uh, by uh, giving the patient non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers that inhibit the voltage-gated calcium channel. Um, and then lastly, there is phase three, which um, happens by an activation of the calcium channels, uh, and then you activate some of the potassium channels and you have the cell going back, uh, repolarizing and going back to its uh, normal state. So uh, this is the SA node action potential. The ventricular action potential uh, starts really with phase four, which is the resting potential. And then you have phase zero, one, two, three, and four. And really, if you understand uh, that part, you'll be able to understand the uh, rest of the antiarrhythmics. And I kind of have it here uh, by which antiarrhythmics block which which phase. So um, you you know you have phase zero, phase four, which is the resting potential. And then after that, you have depolarization. And in depolarization in phase zero, you have the sodium channel uh, channels open. So the sodium goes into the cell, um, and that that's what causes the cell to depolarize. Um, and phase zero is inhibited by class one antiarrhythmics. So I guess let me take a step back first and talk about the classes of antiarrhythmics. So there is four classes of um, antiarrhythmics. Class one is sodium channel blockers. Uh, class two is beta blockers. Uh, class three is potassium channel blockers, and then class four is calcium channel blockers. So um, and you know they kind of work in 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 uh, in d different phases of the of the action potential. So here, phase zero uh, is inhibited by class one antiarrhythmics. So if you inhibit um, if you inhibit uh, the sodium channels, if you block the sodium channels, you're going to block depolarization. Um, and um, what will you what will you get in the EKG? So yes, you'll get a prolonged QRS because QRS is a measure of your depolarization. So you get a prolonged depolarization um, and you get a prolonged QRS. Uh, phase one is the initial repolarization phase where the sodium channels that you've opened earlier, uh, they start to close. And then the potassium channels begin to open. So you start repolarizing your cell. Uh, phase two, which is right here, is sort of like a plateau phase. Uh, the calcium 
uh, some calcium goes into the cell uh, that balances uh, potassium that's going out and you get like a plateau phase. And then uh, lastly, phase three, which is rapid repolarization. And what happens is potassium goes out of the cell uh, to make it its resting state, its resting negative state. So you have a massive K potassium efflux. And um, this phase is inhibited by what class of antiarrhythmics? Yes, class three antiarrhythmics because they block the potassium uh, potassium channels. So if you block repolarization, what will you find in the EKG? You'll find a prolonged QT interval because the QT interval is a measure of repolarization. So all um, class three antiarrhythmics they will uh, they will have a prolonged uh, QT interval as a side effect. And then lastly, phase four you go back to the resting potential. So just you know highlights of this uh, phase zero sodium goes out and it's blocked by class one phase, uh, uh, sorry, um, phase zero sodium comes into the cell blocked by class one antiarrhythmics, um, and you have a prolonged QRS if that's the case. And then uh, phase three potassium comes out and it's blocked by class three antiarrhythmics and then you have a prolonged QT. So with that in mind, let's start talking about the classes. So as we, as I've mentioned earlier, um, the antiarrhythmics are classified into four classes. So class one, class two, class three, and class four. And then do you guys remember what class one antiarrhythmics block? Yes, the sodium channels. Um, into class one, there are subclassifications. So class one A, class one B, and class one C. And how they are subclassified is the how fast they, uh, the cells recover from the binding of the drug. So 1A is intermediate binding, uh, 1B is very fast binding, and then 1C is slow binding. So that's how they kind of classify it. So talking specifically about the class 1A uh, antiarrhythmics, these are sodium channel blockers, and examples in this class is quinidine, uh, procainamide and disopyramide. Really the important ones is quinidine and procainamide. Um, they block sodium channels, uh, but they actually don't just block sodium channels, they're kind of dirty drugs. They go after the potassium channels as well. So um, they uh, prolong the action potential, they prolong the QRS because you block the sodium channel and then you prolong the, you know, the um, this phase, phase zero. Um, and sometimes you can prolong the QT interval as well because you're blocking some of the potassium channels. Um, in addition, it prolongs the refractory period. So the refractory period is this period where the cell is refractory to any action potential. So this is the what what the action potential looks like if uh, the cell is uh, given uh, one of the class A antiarrhythmics and you will have on your block exam maybe um, like a figure that will uh, that will show you uh, different uh, uh, different antiarrhythmics, and then we'll ask you which antiarrhythmics um, uh, has this representation. So for this one, it's class one A uh, because the uh, slope is decreasing for the phase zero, and then you have a prolonged action potential. Um, these drugs are used for re-entry and ectopic supraventricular tachycardia. Um, and they're also used for ventricular tachycardia. Again, remember that we're blocking the ventricular cells uh, from depolarizing. Uh, side effects is also important. Quinidine um, causes synchronism, and synchronism uh, is a fancy word for just head headache and tinnitus. And do you guys remember what other drug causes synchronism? Aspirin. Yes, very good. So aspirin also causes synchronism. Uh, in addition, um, uh, procainamide. Procainamide can cause uh, drug-induced uh, lupus. So I think uh, Mike talked to you about the antihypertensives. Do you guys remember what other drug causes drug-induced lupus? Hydralazine. Yeah, so procainamide and hydralazine, they cause drug-induced lupus. So you get a lot of the um, uh, of the manifestations of lupus, and you guys will learn about learn about it later. But for now, understand that these drugs cause drug-induced lupus, um, and then um, also they cause uh, prolonged QT uh, interval, and they cause something called torsade de Plon. And um, I think it's 
kind of important to understand what Tersod's uh, is. So I'm going to take a minute to kind of show you what it is. So this is a form of ventricular fibrillation. So the ventricles kind of uh, f um, fibrillate, they don't beat really well. And then you get this uh, wide uh, QRS complex, uh, and then it kind of goes a little bit smaller, and then it becomes wide again, goes a little bit smaller, and becomes wide again. Um, and this is due to prolonged QT uh, interval. I'm not going to go into the pathophysiology really quick, but please, 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 for um, the sake of, um, you know, honestly, like uh, your clinical practice and the uh, step one, understand torsades and understands what causes torsades because it's very, very high yield. So um, this is to just tell you that class 1A cause can cause torsade deployment due to QT prolongation. Um, just a note on the uh, on all the class 1 antiarrhythmics is that they are state dependent. So what does that mean that they're state dependent? That means that they affect conduction in the frequently depolarized cell. So if the cell is depolarized, that means it's um, it's getting the action potential more than its neighboring cells, the class 1 antiarrhythmics will go after it. So uh, that's why it's very good for tachycardia, because in tachycardia the cells are uh, depolarized. Um, and as I've said earlier, uh, class 1A has intermediate recovery time, so the drug goes in, stays for a little bit, and then comes off. Um, so that's for class 1A. Uh, this is just, you know, as I've said, Tersot. Uh, class 1B, uh, there are also sodium channel blockers. And do you guys remember what's the difference between class 1A and class 1B in terms of recovery time? Yeah, class 1B has fast recovery time. So class 1A is intermediate, class 1B is fast recovery time. Examples of class 1B is lidocaine and mixeltine. Lidocaine and mixeltine, you can sort of consider them the same drug, uh, but lidocaine is IV and mixeltine is, is oral. So how they work is that they block the sodium channels and they decrease the action potential. So they, uh, class 1A increases the action potential, um, class 1B decreases the action potential. So see the action, the action potential of the regular cell is here, and then when you give the drug, it decreases the action potential. So they decrease the QRS, uh, and they don't really have an effect on the QT interval. Uh, big, big high yield point that you're not going to see on the block exam, but you'll see a lot on the U world questions, is that class 1B specifically um, goes after the ischemic tissue. They have a tendency to go after uh, tissue that have been deprived of oxygen. So example of that is uh, post post MI, where um, some of the tissue has infarcted, and uh, lidocaine and mixeltine uh, kind of binds to these cells. So it becomes very good for the use of ventricular arrhythmias post uh, myocardial infarction. And just of a side note, lidocaine is not just an antiarrhythmic, but it's also an anesthetic, because it blocks sodium channels, so it blocks the nerve conduction. So you can use topical lidocaine to uh, anesthetize, you know, whatever you need to anesthetize. Uh, side effects uh, are also related to sodium channel blockade. So they cause CNS depression because they, you know, block the sodium channels. And they also cause cardiovascular collapse. If you give too high of a dose for lidocaine, you can block the sodium channels and um, you get collapse of your cardiovascular system. Uh, and I've said, as I've said, class 1B has fast uh, recovery time. Uh, Finally, uh, the last of the class 1 antiarrhythmics is class 1C, and examples of this is flecainide and propafenone. Um, and uh, what they do is, again, they block sodium uh, channels, and these guys, they prolong the action potential. So class 1A prolongs the action potential, class 1B decreases the action potential, and then class 1C prolongs the action potential. Um, it's used for supraventricular tachycardia, and it's also used for AFib uh, to control the rhythm. So let's say patient has atrial fibrillation, and you want to convert them back to normal sinus rhythm, you can use um, these drugs. Um, side effects is important for the class 1C. Uh, there was a study um, back in the 1990s, I believe, uh, that shows that if you use flecainide or propafenone in patients who have structural heart disease or ischemic heart disease, they have higher mortality. So uh, it's actually contraindicated to be used in uh, these type of patients. Um, and fortunately, with these antiarrhythmics, they're also proarrhythmic. So 
um, honestly, whether it's class 1A um, or class 1C, you have a, you can have a tendency to induce an arrhythmia. And the mechanism is not really understood, but they are pro-arrhythmic. Um, and finally, class 1C has slow uh, recovery time. So um, class 1A, uh, uh, intermediate recovery, uh, class 1C, uh, fast recovery, uh, class 1C is slow uh, recovery. Um, and again, all of class 1 are sodium channel uh, blockers. Now we go to class uh, 2 antiarrhythmics. So class 2 antiarrhythmics are beta blockers. And I'm not going to talk too much in depth about beta blockers because Mike should have already, uh, Mike uh, have covered it with uh, w talking about it in the antihypertensive, but I'll talk about it from an arrhythmic standpoint. So the, um, the antiarrhythmic mechanism of action is that they decrease the SA and the AV node uh, automaticity by decreasing the slope of phase four. So I'm gonna go back real quick. And you guys remember here, this phase four. So uh, they decrease the slope of phase four and they decrease the automaticity. And remember, this is um, in the um, uh, in the node. So this is in the SA and the AV node, not necessarily in the ventricular uh, myocytes. So they particularly affect the AV node, um, and the effect is decreasing the heart rate. Um, they also prolong the PR interval. And do you guys remember what the PR interval is? So that's the time it takes from uh, the action potential to get from the uh, from the SA node to the uh, to the AV node. So it prolongs uh, prolongs that time because you're blocking the AV node. Uh, Antiarrhythmic use is that they're used for supraventricular tachycardias, and they're also used for rate control uh, for atrial fibrillation because, you again, you are blocking uh, the nodes. Uh, Cardiac-specific side effects, anytime you block the nodes, you get AV, you can get uh, an AV block uh, from uh, beta blockers. So class 1, sodium channel blockers, class 2, uh, beta blockers. Uh, class 3 is potassium channel blockers. So if you guys remember our action potential, here is phase 4, phase 0, phase 1, 2, 3 is when the potassium uh, comes out of the uh, of the cell. So um, class 3 is, uh, examples is amiodarone, ibutilide, dufetilide, and sodalol. Uh, really, the most important of them is amiodarone. How they work is that they block the potassium channel and they block the repolarization. So if you block the repolarization, you are going to prolong the QT interval because that's the measure of your repolarization. And that's uh, what you would see on an action potential. So here's a regular action potential, and this is an action potential uh, that is uh, uh, that is uh, shown if you block the uh, phase, phase three. Uh, they're used for atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and ventricular tachycardia. Um, again, anytime you prolong the QT interval, uh, you get uh, a risk of torsades de point, and then we talked about torsades, uh, torsades earlier. I wanted to spend just a, a couple minutes talking about amiodarone because amiodarone is actually... Um, a very, very, very high yield drug because it has a lot of like specific side effects. So I'll take a minute to talk about it. Um, how amiodarone works. Uh, amiodarone is lumped under class three, but it really has properties of all classes. So it has class one, two, three, and four properties. So it blocks the sodium channels. Um, it blocks uh, the beta receptor, so it's a beta blocker. It blocks the potassium channels. It also blocks the calcium channels. But really, everything is sort of like in the right amount. The amiodarone actually, actually works really well. Um, it's used for atrial fibrillation or atrial flutters um, because it blocks the nodes. It's used for ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation because it blocks the sodium, uh, the sodium channels. Side effects is what I wanted to focus on amiodarone because this is what you're going to be tested on the exam and on your shelves and on step. Um, and really in clinical practice as well, you'll see that a lot. Uh, if it blocks the potassium channels, what is it going to do? Yes, it's going to prolong the QT interval and you have a risk of torsades de point. Um, also, amiodarone can 
cause hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. And the reason for that is that because it contains iodine. 40% of amiodarone is, is iodine. So before starting amiodarone, you need a baseline thyroid function test, so TSH and like T4 and T3, to make sure that uh, anything that develops after you start amiodarone is not from the amiodarone. Um, Next, uh, amiodarone causes pulmonary fibrosis, um, so you need a baseline chest x-ray to, um, to monitor the patient. Um, also, you get these um, corneal deposits, uh, deposits, and the reason for that is amiodarone acts as a haptin, so it goes and complexes with, uh, with antibodies, and these complexes deposit. So they deposit in the cornea and they deposit in the skin, and that's why you need a baseline eye exam. Um, Fourth, amiodarone uh, is metabolized via the liver, so it ca can cause hepatotoxicity. Um, and it's metabolized by the CYP enzyme. So imagine if it's metabolized by the CYP enzyme, it has tons of drug interactions. Um, and uh, last thing that I want you to be aware of amiodarone is that it has a very, very long half-life. So it's about two months. Because it deposits in all of these tissues, it has a very long half-life. So... Um, Couple words on amiodarone or high yield points uh, blocks all the all the channels uh, used for AFib and ventricular uh, arrhythmias causes uh, thyroid issues, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and has a lot of drug interactions. If you know that, I think you'll be golden. Um, so we talked about class one. These are the sodium channel blockers. Class two, these are the beta blockers. Class three, these are the potassium channel blockers. And then finally, class four, these are the calcium channel blockers. And they're not just the regular calcium channel blockers, they're the non-dihydropyridine uh, calcium channel blockers. Um, an example of this is two medications, verapamil and doltiazem. And it's really important to understand the difference between the, hydro, the dihydropyridines and the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers because the non-dihydropyridines also affect the heart uh, versus the dihydropyridines, they, are only, uh, they only work in the vasculature, they're vascular uh, dilators. So for these two medications, verapamil and doltiazem, Mike uh, spoke about the antihypertensive effects about it. Uh, so I'm going to speak about the antiarrhythmic effects. So they slow the conduction velocity in the SA and the AV node. They don't really work in the ventricular cells, but they work on the uh, uh, the nodes. So as you see here, uh, they uh, they slow the they slow the rise of the action potential and they prolong repolarization. So that's an example of what a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like verapamil or doltiazem will do to the action potential. And which action potential is this? Yes, this is in the nodes, the SA or the AV nodes. Cardiac specific side effects is that they can cause sinus node depression, which makes sense if you're gonna block the nodes, AV block. And then lastly, um, they cause heart failure exacerbation. The reason that, that they cause heart failure exacerbation because they block calcium and calcium uh, uh, increases the contractility of the heart. So if you block if you block calcium, then you're going to block the contractility, and you're going to affect the inotropy, which means the contractility of the heart. So you don't want to use it in a patient that has heart failure because you'll cause them to have a, a heart failure exacerbation. Um, so we talked about the classes of anti, uh, uh, the four classes of antiarrhythmics. Um, other uh, miscellaneous uh, antiarrhythmics are uh, first is adenosine. Um, so adenosine works by opening the potassium channels um, and allows potassium out of the out of the cell. If you allow the potassium out of the cell, the cell is going to be very negative and it's going to be hyperpolarized. This uh, effect is mainly in the AV node, so it decreases AV conduction. Um, adenosine is very, very, very important to understand that uh, it's used to terminate supraventricular tachycardia. So any tachycardia that's coming above the ventricle or above the AV node, adenosine terminates that. And this is an important um, uh, high yield point that you will be examined uh, on. 
it's not just any supraventricular tachycardia, but it's hemodynamically unstable supraventricular tachycardia that adenosine is used to prevent. And the reason for that is that it has a very short half-life, it works really well, and it's used to terminate these, uh, these arrhythmias. Um, side effects is that you actually get a transient asystole, so the heart kind of stops for like a second. Uh, you get some bronchospasm, and then you uh, patients say that they have the sense of impending uh, doom. So adenosine, really important to know that it's used to terminate hemodynamically unstable supraventricular tachycardia. Um, next is digoxin. In digoxin, we're going to talk about it in the inotropes uh, lecture, and we'll discuss why it's used as an antiarrhythmic. Uh, lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, Wolf, Parkinson, White because it's not really uh, mentioned anywhere else, and Dr. Uh, Pullen uh, talks about Wolf, Parkinson, White. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but understand uh, that it's an abnormal fast accessory conduction pathway from the atria to the ventricle. Normal pathway is that you have the SA node and then going to the AV node and then you get to the uh, bundle of Hiss and then the Purkinje fibers. Um, Wolf Parkinson White, you have like an extra conduction over here. So this, you you make this circuit um, that uh, that is accessory, and the circuit bypasses the AV node, which makes the ventricles depolarize earlier. The characteristics for uh, the ECG is that you get a delta wave. Uh, delta wave is the slurped uh, wave over here, um, and then you have a widened QRS and then a short uh, PR. And Wolf Parkinson White also is a high yield um, ECG to know. Uh, for your steps. Um, how you treat Wolf Parkinson White? The first thing that you do is uh, you can actually ablate this uh, point, uh, the accessory point, by laser. Um, and you go with a catheter um, and you ablate it with laser. Um, second, you want to avoid AV nodal blockers. And you're going to tell me why do we want to avoid AV nodal blockers? And the reason is. Um, this accessory pathway is already going too fast. So if you block the AV node, that you're going to allow time for this accessory pathway to go through. Um, so that's why we want to keep the AV node not blocked. And examples of drugs that block the AV node are non-dihydropyridine, calcium channel blockers, digoxin, and metoprolol. Uh, lastly, uh, you can use procainamide. Um, not sure if it's very helpful or not, but procainamide uh, can be used in Wolf Parkinson uh, White. This is an example of the ECG of Wolf Parkinson White, and you see the slurped uh, delta wave. Um, and uh, uh, here it's not very widened, but you should get a widened QRS. Lastly, I just wanted to summarize the treatment of arrhythmia since it's kind of scattered all over uh, the place, and I wanted to give you one concise uh, place to talk about treatment of. Uh, of arrhythmia. First thing is we're going to talk about is uh, treatment of atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is just the atria uh, fibrillating and you have uh, like a foci that's kind of making all of this uh, all of this fuss and this foci of arrhythmogenic tissue is going to the AV node and it's making the AV node work faster and then the AV node is making the ventricles go, go faster. So there's two strategies to treat atrial fibrillation. The first strategy is that you can control the rate that the ventricles are going at. Uh, and this is really the preferred strategy. Uh, the second strategy is that you can control the rhythm uh, that the um, that the vent uh, you can control the rhythm. Meaning, if the patient is atrial in atrial fibrillation, you can convert them into sinus um, into sinus rhythm. Um, and this is not very preferred, and I'll tell you why. So first thing is rate control. Um, you can use beta blockers. Um, deltaism, uh, amiodarone, or digoxin. So if you notice here, there's a theme. Anything that blocks the AV node, you can use it for rate control. Um, and this is the preferred method. Um, the other method is rhythm control. And uh, rhythm control use antiarrhythmic. So mainly uh, class uh, class three antiarrhythmics. That's what you use to uh, control uh, the uh, the arrhythmia, uh, specifically AFib. And the reason why we don't use it is because they have um, a lot of uh, 
uh, a lot of side effects and they have a lot of uh, risk, uh, mainly uh, prolonged QT uh, interval. But we can use rhythm control in patients that are not tolerating the uh, the high pace of the uh, of the atrial fibrillation. Uh, I'm not going to to go too much into deep depth, but just understand that there's two strategies to control atrial fibrillation. The first strategy is rate control, and then the second strategy is rhythm control. Uh, finally, if the arrhythmia is hemodynamically unstable, you can uh, use cardioversion. So you can uh, either use adenosine or you can use electrical cardioversion to, uh, to bring it back to normal sinus rhythm. So that's atrial fibrillation. Uh, next is supraventricular tachycardia. So this is any tachycardia that's arising above the ventricles. Uh, first line for supraventricular tachycardia is vasovagal uh, maneuvers. So um, you do the Valsava maneuver and you can uh, uh, you can uh, try to terminate the tachycardia. Uh, second, you can actually use carotid massage. So carotid massage um, kind of stimulates the vagus nerve and can uh, terminate the tachycardia. Uh, second line, you can use beta blockers, uh, deltaism, verapamil, or a class 1 and 3 anti, uh, antiarrhythmics. Uh, and third line, you can use cardioversion if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. So you can use adenosine or uh, electrical cardioversion means that you can shock the patient. Uh, next is ventricular tachycardia. So ventricular tachycardia is pretty much the ventricles going on their own and uh, they're beating very fast. And ventricular tachycardia is uh, dangerous. And do you know why ventricular tachycardia is dangerous? Because it eventually can turn into ventricular fibrillation. In ventricular fibrillation, you don't get any cardiac output to the rest of your body. And, you know, there is very, very high risk of death. So ventricular uh, tachycardia, you can use any of the antiarrhythmics for it. But specifically, uh, lidocaine is uh, used for ventricular tachycardia and amiodarone uh, is used as well. You can also uh, use cardioversion uh, if the tachycardia is hemodynamically unstable. Um, just a couple more things, ventricular fibrillation. So uh, this is when the ventricles kind of uh, try, try to beat, but they're not really beating. Um, in ventricular fibrillation, what you uh, do is you defibrillate. So you give an electric shock to bring the ventricles back into their normal uh, sinus rhythm. And lastly, torsades de point. And I talked a little bit about torsades de point. And uh, there is another name for torsades. It's called polymorphic ventricular uh, um, ventricular fibrillation. So um, uh, it's polymorphic. That means it's it changes the uh, the shape because it goes up high and then it comes a little bit low. Very 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 important to understand for torsades de point is that the first line treatment is magnesium. And I'm not really sure why magnesium is used to treat torsades de point, but understand that it's very high yield for exams and they'll show up on questions all the time. Uh, and then the second thing that you do besides giving magnesium is you defibrillate the patients. So this is just a really quick summary of, uh, of, uh, of arrhythmias um, and a quick uh, overview of antiarrhythmics.